All right, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to today's edition of the uh, Polyplay webinar. Uh, today, we have a, a double feature on underneath gametes. Uh, and up first is Dr. Julia Kreiner. Uh, Julia is a recent uh, PhD graduate from the labs of Stephen Wright and John Stinchcomb at the University of Toronto, where she's been studying the population genomics of herbicide resistance uh, adaptation. Her undergraduate thesis work with Brian Husband at the University of Guelph explored the evolutionary dynamics of underused gamete production across the Brassicaceae, and it's that work that she'll talk to us uh, about today. Uh, coming up soon here in May, uh, Julia will be a Killam and Bioinformatics uh, Biodiversity Research Center postdoctoral fellow uh, at the Biodiversity Research Center at the University of British Columbia, uh, where she'll continue exploring these various themes that she's been working on. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna let uh, Julia take it away and tell us about her, her really, really exciting research on underused gamete formation. Thanks a lot, Mike. Yeah, thanks for hosting me. And I want to thank Ben, actually, for proposing this idea of uh, speaking together. So I'm excited to tell you guys about the work I did with Brian Husband um, and Paul Crone at the University of Guelph um, to better understand the frequency and evolutionary maintenance of unreduced gametes and thinking about uh, implications for polyploid formation. So I think I'm probably at the right audience today for you guys appreciating the importance of polyploidy across vascular plants, but I felt like I had to incorporate this slide here. Um, you know, there's been a ton of estimates of, of the uh, how widespread the incidence of polyploidy across um, plant lineages and angiosperms. We're seeing that varies anywhere from four to 50%. And Mike has done some really awesome work uh, teasing apart the role of aloe and autopolyploid um, in, in generating angiosperm diversity. So it, I think we all recognize the importance of polyploidy here. Um, and there's been some really um, insightful conceptual work thinking about kind of the phases of polyploid evolution in this kind of ecological evolutionary ecological context from Thompson and Lumeret, um, being the first formation, establishment, and persistence. And I think there's been a, a ton of work on these latter two phases in particular, establishment and persistence, thinking about things like minority cytotype exclusion principle, which we're gonna hear a bit more about today, um, and so that's the mating disadvantage that new polyploid individuals experience, um, assortative mating, competition, inbreeding depression, um, a lot of different things, how polyploidy influences kind of these ecological and evolutionary factors in plant populations. But the first one, formation, I think has experienced a, a, a lot less work in the literature. And that means understanding kind of the rate and number of origins uh, of polyploid formation. Uh, predisposing characteristics that species might have that make them more likely to form new polyploids and the underlying mechanisms of polyploid formation. So this first part is really what we're gonna be focusing on today. And I'm really excited to, to hear about how some of the work I've done, um, Ben's followed up on to think how the, the data I've looked at for polyploid formation through unreduced gametes might feed into some of these later processes like establishment. So um, this amazing review from Harlan Duet from 1975 on a wing and a prayer uh, was the first to, I, I think, say that almost all polyploids arise by way of unreduced gametes, but other, mechanism, other mechanisms may occur but are negligible. Um, and so there's two ways or two key ways in which um, unreduced gametes can unite to form new polyploids. And we like to break this down into a one-step and a two-step process, the two-step process, which we can call triploid bridge. So what I'm depicting here is just the, the male and female um, reproductive organs of the plant. So this is an individual who's diploid and um, this diploid female might produce uh, an unreduced uh, ovule, whereas this uh, um, pollen um, from this hermaphroditic individual might also be unreduced. So when you have these two unreduced gametes coming together, you're gonna to produce um, uh, a uh, polyploid individual. So that's that one step process. With a triploid bridge, you might have a, a female unreduced gamete, but a male normal reduced haploid gamete in the case of a diploid individual that can unite to form a triploid. And that triploid probably is gonna have some issues with meiosis such that it could produce, um, it could produce one X, two X or three X gametes. And so there's a variety of ways in which this might give rise to a polyploid. The simplest two-step process might be a, a, a triploid individual produces an unreduced 3X gamete, which goes on to unite with the normal haploid gamete producing uh, a tetraploid individual. So it's 
conceptually simple, but there's a lot of different ways in which this can happen. And we like to think about these different two step processes, these one versus two step processes. So we knew unreduced gametes uh, had been looked at a lot in the kind of plant breeding literature, especially plant cultivars. But um, when I started working on this, there was really, we identified a, a four kind of key research needs in the understanding the population biology of two end gametes. The first being the frequency of unreduced gametes in natural populations. And we kind of did a literature search um, that we published in, well, not, sorry, not just a, a literature review, but we kind of synthesized these needs in, a, in this paper in Trends in Genetics. Um, and from that literature review, we actually found only two studies that looked at the frequency of two end gametes in more than two uh, natural populations. So there's still a lot of work to be done just to understand their frequency. Another thing which we really don't know much about is the variation in heritability of unreduced gametes among individuals. The relationship between male and female two end gametes, a lot of the work has been done um, on male gametes. And we make some assumptions that what we, what we learn about male gametes is reciprocated in females so that we can you know, make predictions about the rate of polyploid formation. But there still really needs to be a lot of work done on um, unreduced female gametes, which tends to be more technically challenging to do. And the, other, the last thing is factors promote, promoting the maintenance of unreduced gametes in natural populations. And so for the work I'm talking about today, I'm really focusing on the first and the last bullet point here. So how frequent and variable are two end male gametes in natural populations? And given the frequency we observe, what can we say about the evolutionary processes that maintain them? So what maintains the production of two end gametes in this evolutionary context? Well, um, one hypothesis that has been put forward is the adaptive or lineage persistence hypothesis is what I'll call it. Um, the idea being that the ability to produce unreduced gametes might facilitate lineage survival by allowing for polyploid speciation, particularly in response to stress. And, you know, I think we've seen um, that, you know, polyploid formation can facilitate like niche expansion and that polyploids often tend to have um, a greater tolerance to stress. And so, um, this hypothesis kind of is drawing on that. We kind of actually put forward the reverse, this maladaptive hypothesis that two end gamete production actually might be maladaptive and persistent populations with decreased selection and increased mutational input. And in large part, we were thinking about it th that way because unreduced gamete tends to result from meiotic abnormality, ab abnormalities. There's a many different uh, kind of problems that can occur in meiosis. Um, that lead to failure of reduction in division ultimately um, and, and, and result in this unreduced gamma formation. But from an ecological perspective, there's another reason to think, think this. So I'm just gonna outline the scenario for maladaptive unreduced gamma production in large part that outlines that the production of polypoid offspring should in large part not contribute to progenitor diploid fitness. So say here we have this population of um, diploid individuals. And for uh, the majority of their gametes are produced are one and haploid gametes. And so when those unite, you know, it produces diploid individuals which contribute to uh, mating in that population. But rarely they might produce unreduced two end gametes. Uh, when those two unite, um, you're gonna form, you know, this offshoot, you know, tetraploid population. But the, the big limitation is that the rates of gene flow back from a neotetraploid population into a diploid progenitor population have found to be negligible. Um, there is, I think we need a little bit of a better understanding on the role of triploid, uh, triploid individuals or how common this process is, but in by and large in our understanding right now, there's a uh, pretty low rates of gene flow from tetraploid populations back into diploid populations. And that really outlines the fact that unreduced gamete production should not be contributing by and large to diploid fitness. So if this is the case, and if unreduced gamete pr uh, production is maladaptive, we can think about kind of evolutionary processes that might maintain um, their production um, based on how, you know, how characteristics might decrease or how, how they influence the efficacy of selection or their mutational input. So it's really thinking about how these characteristics might tip the like mutational se selection balance uh, to, to remove these from the population. So the first thing we can think about is the effective mating system, outcrossing and something. 
Um, selfing species have low effective population size. We expect that they, as a result, they should have a lower efficacy of selection. And so we might expect to see a higher frequency of unreduced gametes and selfers compared to outcrossers. I think even more extreme on this continuum of relaxed selection, we might find that asexuals, which rely very rarely on sexual reproduction, probably have low investment in their, um, in their gametes. We might expect to see particularly relaxed selection on those type of processes resulting in um, the, you know, the accumulation of, of two end gametes in those asexual species. One more hypothesis we can make on this scale of kind of efficacy, efficacy, efficacy or opportunity for selection is life history characteristics where annuals are reproducing much more regularly relying on uh, you know, efficient sexual reproduction compared to perennials. So there might be more opportunity for selection on these processes. On the other hand, for mutational input, one hypothesis we could make, if unreduced gamete production was polygenic, you might expect um, species with larger genomes might have more uh, mutational, uh, larger mutational target size for which um, unreduced gamete production uh, might be modified. But also one thing we weren't able to test in this, um, but we tried to kind of use genome size as a proxy for, which I know is not perfect, is the his past history of polyploidy. I think one of the probably most significant predictors that we can expect for unreduced gamete production is um, cyto you know, previous um, cytotype variation or a history of polyploidy in that plant lineage, because you can imagine it kind of being a runaway process. Um, you know, how did that polyploid form? Probably through, through unreduced gamete production. And so they're almost um, you know, inherently um, inheriting that heritability for unreduced gamete production at higher ploidies. So we can, we can take these hypotheses for characteristics, how they might influence the unreduced gamete production, and see if we uh, get the direction that we would expect, given these hypotheses, to better understand you know, um, the fitness consequences of unreduced gametes. But the first thing we wanted to do, of course, was to assay the frequency of these gametes across species, across populations and individuals. So um, I went out to, um, I guess, maybe about 30 or 20 locales across Ontario, mostly Gulf Hamilton region. I was able to sample almost 24 brassicaceous species. Some of these were in really nice areas, like I was sampling in Hamilton, uh, along Lake Ontario, or kind of these nice little um, water basins. I think this is a Sicimbrium officinale there, poking through. Um, but for the large part, I mean, these are pretty weedy species. So what was awesome though about these collections is that um, I would be able to collect maybe three or four species from exactly the same um, site, from the same environment. They're co-occurring. And so we can not only get at, um, you know, variation due to environmental differences, but from the same location, we can get the same species that might uh, relate more to like species level variation and, and genetic uh, differences for the propensity for unused gamete production. So we were actually able to sample almost 1,700 individuals to understand the, the rate of unreduced gamete production. And um, from those individuals, I would collect them, I'd bring back whole samples from the lab, which so I'd pretty much snip the inflorescence, put them in, in water in the lab, bring them back, um, desiccate their pollen for later flow cytometry. And I was able to do this work in large part because um, Paul Crone really um, um, spec, uh, nailed down the technique for flow cytometry for unreduced gamete um, detection in Brassicaceae. And, and the reason it's, we're able to do it in Brassicaceae is because they're spherical sperm nuclei. So it's, it's still a challenge for assaying unreduced gamete with flow cytometry in other species where their, their sperm are not spherical. And that's because de depending on the orientation that the, the sperm would pass, the sperm um, nuclei would pass through, you might get different fluorescence readings. So it's, I think there's, Paul's still working on developing it, um, but this was really awesome to do in Brassicaceae because you get these really clean peaks of 1C and 2C. So the, the, two, the 2C peak is almost double the fluorescent area and that corresponds with the proportion of, of these pollen grains that were unreduced. And he's also worked on approaches for um, distinguishing debris, but also um, a lot of the time you can get these, uh, these spherical sperm nuclei sticking together. And so with these gating approaches, we can actually really clearly distinguish um, true unreduced gametes from debris, from 1C pollen, and from doublet um, 
doublets, uh, spur move there that have stuck together. So we use these approaches across these 1,700 individuals to look at the global distribution of unreduced gamete production. And we found um, uh, that production varied from zero to 85%. So a single individual produced up to 85% unreduced gametes, which was uh, pretty remarkable to see. The average across individuals was about 2%. The average across species means was 2.5%. And I think uh, that mean is actually much higher than was previously estimated. So Ramsey and Chomsky did a review on unreduced gamete frequency and they, they, their estimated uh, unreduced gamete production was about five times lower what we found here with, this, with our assays. And another, I think really remarkable thing is that 90% of individuals, 96% of the 1700 individuals we assayed produced some level of unreduced gametes. So I think just speaking to, you know, actually how widespread, you know, or how maintained this kind of trait is across individuals. Not only that, we, we found that most variation in unreduced gamete production was actually found at the individual level. So about 30% of the variation we described was among species, about 15% among populations and over 50% among individuals. So I think it speaks to really important environmental and age effects uh, you know, influencing the production of unreduced gametes. And this is something that really hasn't been looked at very much. I mean, there's, we know that there's plasticity in unreduced gametes, but I think there's a lot more to be done about determinants of this, this variation uh, among individuals among, and among populations. So I just want to show you one example here of the variation among populations that we saw. And so uh, this is in the species Aliaria pediolata which is commonly known as garlic mustard. It's really widespread here in Ontario. It's a bit of an invasive weed. Um, and so we typically collect about 20 to 30 individuals per population. We, we got one population with about hundred individuals. And I just like eyeballing these, these histograms, you can see there's, there's quite a lot of variation in the distributions we see. Some actually have a pretty high minimum, like individuals at minimum are producing one or 2%. Um, and they have a pretty high mean. Others that have, you know, individuals that produce up to 12%, and other ones that have this, you know, strong kind of right skew with, with most individuals centered around zero. So a lot of variation among populations in unreduced gamete production. So now we kind of have a better understanding about the frequency of unreduced gametes across our uh, populations and species. But I wanted, we wanted to really test those hypotheses about uh, whether we could find correlates of unreduced gametes, uh, specifically reproductive mode, life history, and genome size. We weren't able to do uh, polypoidy itself, like what poidy level each individual was, because we would have needed um, uh, squashes, uh, chromosome squashes for that. Like we tried to back calculate from genome size, but we just felt it was a bit of a, an indirect metric of polypoidy. So those were the three traits that we tested against. Uh, unreduced gamete production. And if we did see correlates, could we make some inferences about what that implies about the evolutionary forces maintaining and allowing twin gametes to persist? So um, these are the species that I ended up sampling. Um, a nice variety across reproductive modes. We had asexual, selfing, mixed mating, and outcrossing species life histories, annual, biennial, and perennial, and a, quite a range of genome sizes. And these were genome sizes that we calculated based on our flow cytometric estimates for each individual we collected. Um, um, on reduced gamete four, we also did flow cytometric estimates of their um, vegetative genome size. And so um, the one issue is, so I had to, I recreated this tree from the most up-to-date um, the most up-to-date Brassicaceae phylogeny at the time, but we had some species sampled that weren't um, included in that tree. And so uh, from the literature, I incorporated those individuals like within the, within the genus based on other, um, other phylogenetic um, references in the literature. And I accounted for uncertainty in the placement of those individuals and the branch length associated with those um, using this, um, iterative phylogenetic generalized least squares approach. And so what I did is I ran a thousand of these phylogenetic least squares with these random addition trees. I had a little gift going, but I won't subject you to that again. Um, and so we ran this analysis a thousand times with very slightly different um, branch lengths. 
And when we do this with those three predictors, um, we have found that reproductive mode is the, is the only significant predictor of two and gamete production. And so we, across those thousand iterations, we see the mean p-value for that association is 0 0.019. So what does that look like? So what I'm showing you here are the, um, are the, uh, the least squares means from that phylogenetic generalized uh, test. So this is accounting for uh, you know, a shared evolutionary history among these different species. And the big significant, you know, the big difference we see is uh, between the predominantly asexual lineages and between the sexual lineages. There, um, you know, there's some, di there might be some slight differences here, but we just don't have power to detect it. The, the main difference we're seeing is that asexual lineages tend to have much higher production of unreduced gametes than our sexual ones. And that, that's what we expected um, under this kind of maladaptive hypothesis, um, we expect asexual lineages, uh, you know, not to be putting much investment into um, their gametes, um, such that uh, there's really relaxed selection against unreduced gamete production that allows for them to, to be maintained at higher frequencies. I just wanted to show you uh, like what that actually might look like. So here's some um, um, outcrossing species. So this is the histogram for the, the species means of the frequency of unreduced gamete production. For outcrossers, they're pretty well usually centered around zero. Um, uh, mixed mating Hesperus and Nasturtium, a little more variance. Um, Capsella versus I think I chose this one in particular because I started my uh, PhD work working on the genomics of Capsella. Um, and Descarania was actually the, a real strong outlier for selfing species. Like this distribution was pretty remarkable and it didn't really see uh, much like that except for any sexual species. And that species really underlies that skew here that we're seeing for predominantly, um, or that long tail we're seeing for predominantly selfing species. But these examples of the distribution of unreduced gamete production for asexual species in cardamine um, are really remarkable, actually to the extent that I had to show you an inset here where we have individuals you know, producing almost up to 80% unreduced gametes, a single individual. So really high means, high max here for our asexual species. Um, and it's worth noting for this cardamom concatenata, uh, we actually um, had three cytotypes that we included in this analysis because when we did flow cytometry, there's um, really remarkable variation in the genome size that we were estimating. And it, it was a uh, pretty um, multimodal as well. Um, so there's a past history of polypoidy here associated with these asexuals. And there's something we weren't able, able to decouple because we just, we weren't able to include polypoidy in this estimate. In, in, uh, we weren't able to extract polypoidy estimates for all these samples, but I think it's be something really interesting to follow up on. So, um, this question whether there's a cost to 2 and gamete production, well, we see low frequencies of 2 and gamete consistent with purifying selection. Um, and and the this, uh, this signal of elevated 2 and gamete production in asexuals that it seems to be pretty strong evidence that of relaxed selection or consistent with this hypothesis for um, uh, unreduced gamete as a maladaptive trait. And I say relatively low frequencies um, in that bullet point above, but I really I think this work actually highlighted that two and gametes were much more prevalent than previously thought. Um, a mean of 2.5 percent of across 1,700 species or 1,700 individuals is a more than five times increase from previous estimates. And I think if we were even asking, uh, you know, different different um, plant families, um, many more species, I think we would probably see more exceptions to this rule. Um, I think another really important part from this work is how common these occasional high producers were. You know, we often found individuals with more than 5% unreduced gamete production, and those individuals should contribute very substantially to polyploid formation. And so I think that really narrows this discrepancy between, I think, what was perceived as the low frequency of 2 and gamete production that we would expect, but the high prevalence of polyploidy across angiosperms and canine plants. So um, I think there's still a lot to be done here. And um, Paul, Brian, and I um, tried to, to think about some of these future directions this might go in, in our review. Uh, in particular, what factors govern 2 and gamete 
production or across populations. Um, how does the strength of selection govern to inorganic production vary among reproductive modes? So I think we still don't have quite the resolution we need, but we might expect selfing mating system to have really important impacts on unmatched gametes and other things we didn't think about, like even the pollen to ovule ratio with difference between selfers and outcrossers might be at play here. Um, what's the relationship between 2M gamete production and fitness? That's kind of been um, under underexplored. And with that, I just want to thank um, the Husband Lab and Paul Crone, who were just so amazing in um, in including me into the lab and in getting me excited about this stuff. And it was just such a, a pleasure to work with them. And um, my advisors at U of T who helped me um, wrap this work up, allowed me to wrap this up, work up while I was uh, starting my PhD. So John and Stephen and um, Spencer who, Spencer Barrett, who gave me some great advice and some of the analysis and Luke Mahler, who actually helped me a lot thinking about this phylogenetic approach. So yeah, I think that's it. And thanks a lot. I'm happy to take any questions and open up the board for a discussion. Thank you, Julia. That was a wonderful talk. Um, as usual, if uh, folks have any questions, feel free to post those in the chat or pop on your audio and video and just fire away. I think I see Jonathan getting ready here. So, <laughs> uh, hi everybody. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Julia, for the uh, very nice talk. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, the data went by kind of quickly for my eyes, and so okay. so I'm sure this is um, confusion on my part. But I was looking at um, the high frequency of unreduced gametes and asexuals. And I was wondering how much of this is due to the inclusion of high ploidy levels in, in some of the cardamines. Like, if, yeah, how do you decouple? I mean, high, high ploidy plants obviously are going to produce a lot of unreduced gametes. So, how can I decouple that? In yeah, case? so we, we do have a couple asexual species um, that uh, weren't high ploidy. So, we had a couple of nasturtiums um, that are commonly reproducing. Um, and we had some cardamines that were um, that were not asexual. So we had some like outcrossing and selfing cardamines. So um, hopefully that might you know do a bit to just just decouple that in a regression framework. But I think it's I think it it's something we've been we've been thinking a lot about that um, those cardamines I think are really um, exceptional. And um, they are ha have lots of cytotype variation. They're completely uh, uh, asexual. Like when we were collecting them, you'd see these huge um, mats of like rhizomes coming out. Um, so, yeah, I think it's it's something we weren't able to fully decouple because we we weren't uh, able to get the direct estimates of ploidy level for this regression framework. And it would have been really cool to compete those terms against each other to see how important asexual sexuality is against this past history of, um, of polyploidy. Um, but we, I think we also see a lot of the time that those are coupled in, in nature. So I think it's, it is a little bit, bit of a challenge, but I think with more data across more species that we might be able to disentangle that. Well, I have, I have a question if I can. That was a great talk. Uh, this is David Bertioli. Um, Thanks, from the University of Georgia. Um, and um, re recently there was a nice paper published from um, the from Argentina, um, which talked about unreduced gametes in peanut, um, because peanut is an allotetraploid, of course. And they looked at uh, unreduced gamete formation in, um, in hybrids between A and B species. And uh, and, and they found that there were, there were quite a lot of unreduced gametes, a surprising number, a few percent. Um, and they made the suggestion that actually you could make an allotetraploid by, um, by uh, making use of this, by uh, using unreduced gametes to directly cross-pollinate with peanut. Mm. We, we, we thought this was really interesting and, and we have a number of hybrids like this and we checked and, and we did in fact find as well there were a surprising amount of unreduced gametes and some individuals produce much more than others of the same hybrid combinations as you were saying. Yeah. Um, and we, we thought it'd be really fun to try and use these directly for pollination of peanut actually. But, but one of the things is that the, the, the pollen is all, is all aggregated because most of it is, is not, is, is, um, 
is sterile because it's from an AB hybrid. So whilst you've got fertile gametes there, you can't actually transfer it to a stigma. Um, so um, I'm not sure whether that's actually a question or whether it's, um, it's a comment actually, but um, I, I've realized now it's really a comment, but um, uh -huh. I, I just wondered whether you had any thoughts about, uh, about allotetraploid, allopolyploid formation um, and, um, and, and, and how that might happen considering that a primary hybrid might, uh, would have that gungy pollen. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, I think probably it was mostly really a comment, not a question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, maybe the, the point is like, yeah, that it might even be more rare, right? If you're, if there's so much of this like sterile, like e even the rate of unreduced gamete we see might not be the rate that goes to polypoid formation if a lot of it's like inaccessible and part of these kind of low quality yeah. pollen sacks, right? Um, so, yeah. That's Thank interesting. you. Anyway, no, I just, I check that Thanks. All right, we got um, another question here from uh, Vincent Kastrick. Maybe uh, if you would like to pop on and ask. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, yeah, it was really great. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering by using these individuals that have very high and very low uh, projection of unreduced gametes, would that be possible to simply map? Uh, the genetic determinants of, of, of that trait? And yeah. if so, would you expect any genes from the meiosis pathways or anything like that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I would, I would expect that they would probably be meiosis related. It would be really cool to do like a, a mapping population or some type of GWAS type approach for understanding more of the maybe even polygenic basis of unreduced gamete production if there is like you know di many different types of effect size different frequency alleles but there has been work to look at the genetic basis of unreduced gametes like I think we have I had a slide that I didn't end up including but a number of causal genes have been identified a lot of which are uh, related to meiosis and there's a great review by Brownfield and Collar 2011 that goes over some of these large effect genes but I'm sure there's a ton of variation among individuals across populations for that genetic control. So that'd be really cool. Thanks. All right, well, there's a bunch of other questions here. Um, we are running over into Ben's time. So uh, as always, we'll, we'll come back to those questions. So Julia can stick around to the end of Ben's talk. Awesome. We'll, we'll have plenty of time to circle back and, and ask those uh, at the end. Um, and uh, so I'll let uh, Ben go ahead and, and start uh, sharing a screen and then we'll like I said, build a circle back to all those questions. And Julie, I see the cat has re-entered the room as well. Uh, <laughs> all right, yeah. there you go. <laughs> all right, well, our next speaker is uh, Ben Gerster. Uh, ben is a, a fourth year PhD student in Ken Whitney's lab at the University of New Mexico. Uh, Ben's uh, research focuses on the factors that lead to polyploid formation and persistence in nature. Uh, and uh, Ben's going to talk to us today about uh, some of his work on why so many polyploids accounting for environmental stochasticity in unreduced gaming formation that reconciles theory and observation. With that, I'll let Ben take it away. Awesome. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Mike, and welcome everyone, and thank you for attending this polyploid webinar on unreduced gametes, where I aim to answer this question of why so many polyploids hopefully can demonstrate that through accounting for the environmental stochasticity and unreduced gamut formation that we can reconcile theory with observation. Um, primarily this work is uh, model analysis and it utilizes the empirical observations um, that we just saw shared by Dr. Kreiner. And so first, uh, first I would like to acknowledge that this work was done while residing on what are the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia in New Mexico. Uh, lands which were seized through genocide and have subsequently been bought, sold, and occupied by colonizers. Um, I am humbled to be able to live and work here and aim to support and learn from the stewards of these lands. So the motivation for this work and the title of this talk is this paradox of polyploidy, um, which we kind of just heard about in the previous talk as well. And I describe it as this observation of polyploid prevalence not being supported by existing theory. And so let me just catch everybody kind of up on the main theoretical model that's used to understand the challenges associated with polyploid establishment. So first formalized in 1975 by Don Levin, minority cytotype exclusion states that if two cytotypes live in sympatry, 
minority cytotype will be excluded by the majority cytotype if there's no difference between the two cytotypes. We see that pictorially represented here, starting with an entirely diploid population that either through meiotic error or immigration, we have a tetraploid enter, but eventually be excluded. And this exclusion ultimately is a, a frequency dependent issue where the minority cytotypes not able to last given the gam gamete swampage for the majority cytotype resulting in the formation of inviable hybrids that aren't contributing to the minority cytotype population's continuation. So there's this double whammy, if you will, for the minority cytotype where both their pollen and ovules are wasted. And thus the, excuse me. Um, and so what we see is that in order for the minority cytotype to overcome that they need to look at, they need to overcome both the consequences of their gamete wastage and then also compete with the majority cytotype. And ultimately we know that this barrier must be overcome for polyploids to persist as we know them. And so over a dozen models have actually sought to reconcile our understanding of how MCE is overcome. And from these models, two main components come out, the fitness relationships of the cytotypes and the frequency of unreduced gametes. And what we can see is that when we have a high proportion of unreduced gametes and or the tetraploid has high fitness, MCE can be overcome. However, if we have a low proportion of unreduced gametes and or the tetraploid is low, has low fitness, the minority cytotype succumbs to exclusion. And so some work has actually looked at the fitness relationship as fitness relationships between cytotypes in mixed populations, though more has actually been done on polyploids broadly and we've seen presented through this webinar series across the past year. Now, something that we've heard maybe a little bit less about up until about 30 minutes ago are unreduced gametes. And models generally have the diploids producing nominal rates of unreduced gametes of approximately 2%, which is the mean value approximately recovered by many empirical works, including what we just heard. However, using a single value for unreduced gametes does not capture their complete dynamics. Rather, there exists variation in the rate at which unreduced gametes are formed and thus present in nature. Again, we saw that by the spread of the data in the previous talk. And I think that this is actually a crucial part of what we've been missing out on, on how to understand how theory reconciles with polyploid prevalence. So one might ask, where does this variation in unreduced gametes arise from? So what we're looking at here, or excuse me, uh, unreduced gametes are the product of meiotic error induced by both environment and genetics. And so in this work by Mason et al. in 2011, they looked at the hybrids in brassica allotetraploids uh, of different genotypes. And what we see on the x-axis are parental genotypes on the left and their different hybrid combinations on the right. And the y-axis is showing the percent of male unreduced gametes. And what we can see is that there's a non-uniform response between genotype and the different environment for unreduced gametes. So ultimately what we can say is that it's a complex interaction about environment and genetics leading to unreduced gametes. And that in nature, we can't expect kind of a uniform rate of unreduced gametes in any given population. Um, for example, here in cold treatment, we see you know, kind of vast differences of, of uh, of rate of unreduced gametes based on genotype as well. So to kind of just review what we've talked about so far, polyploidy is common, that I think we can all agree with. In order for that to be the case, MCE must have been overcome. And from the modeling work, we see that MCE can be overcome through either high fitness and or a high mean unreduced gametes. And what I seek to demonstrate today is that it's actually something that should be considered is the high variation in unreduced gametes and that it helps to resolve this paradox of polyploidy. So kind of in short, to answer this question of why so many polyploids, I reckon at least it's in part due to the variation in FRUG or the formation rate of unreduced gametes. And I'll use the remaining time to present my case to you for why that is. So um, I will use the empirical data from, liter from the literature to capture the variation in the formation rate of unreduced gametes and then use an extension of an existing model for overcoming MCE to answer the question. So the data, again, goes to thanks to um, Dr. Kreiner and her work in her undergrad looking at and cataloging the variation of frog um, in Brassicaceae species. 
And what we can see is that it's approximately a log normal distribution with a mean of 2%. And so recall that before I mentioned that previous models used a 2% frog in most of their analyses, which makes perfect sense and is, is logical given what we see here. However, they've left out that ver the variation that we see here. And I, as you will see, this variation is key to helping reconcile theory with our observation. So the model that I used is by Rosh and Morgan. Um, and it is it looked at the effect of self-fertilization, inbreeding depression, and population size on autopolypoid establishment. And I'm looking at the kind of the most simplified case of a completely outcrossing population of infinite size. And this is just for simplification purposes, but I encourage you to read their publication to see how their results um, will interact with the findings that I share with you today. And so ultimately, um, this extension is to investigate the stochasticity and the formation rate of unreduced gametes on model outcome. So let's take a look at the model structure. So here we see a simplified model graphic and the equations for the two different for the two different classes of diploids and tetraploids and the defined variables. And so just to walk through this model, we see that diploids produce haploid gametes that then join, contributing back to the diploid pool, and that at some formation rate of unreduced gametes, we have two N gametes produced by the diploids that then join, forming the tetraploids. The tetraploids are then also contributing to the two N gamete pool and kind of this leakiness from the diploids of this continued formation rate of unreduced gametes, contributing to this pool and growing the tetraploid population. So again, this extension investigates stochasticity in the formation rate of unreduced gametes and asks the question of what effect, if any, does environmental stochasticity in the formation rate of unreduced gametes have on the rate of overcoming minority cytotype exclusion? So some of the assumptions from this model are that the populations of, are of hermaphroditic annual plants, that triploids are assumed are presumed inviolable, and unreduced gametes are only being produced by the diploids. And each generation of a, is of equal length and non-overlapping with each other. So to answer the question of how stochasticity affects model outcome, we first need to understand what happens under a static analysis of the formation rate of unreduced gametes. So let's take a look at that. So what this figure is showing is kind of all the possible outcomes for different input frog values and the predicted frequency of tetraploids from the model. And there are two main points that we need to think about on this figure. The first is called T crit, which corresponds to the Y axis. And it's defined as the tetraploid frequency when reached, that when reached, the tetraploid will spread to fixation. So we can think of T crit as being this cutoff of overcoming MCE. And kind of that's how I will talk about overcoming MCE for the rest of this analysis. The second point is Eucrit, which relates to the x-axis. And Eucrit is defined as the frog frequency required for tetraploids to spread to fixation when the population begins as all diploid. So again, this Eucrit value relates here to the x-axis. And so ultimately, what we can see here um, is that between T-crit and Eucrit, there's this dashed line of an unstable equilibrium for the frequency of tetraploids that if you have a frog under Eucrit, you end up falling back down to this stable equilibrium frequency of tetraploids. So to summarize that a little bit easier, here are some colors about will not and will overcome MCE. And so if you have a frog value greater than Eucrit, we see that you will overcome MCE. And if you have a frog value under Eucrit and below T-crit, event you will see that you will not overcome MCE. Also, if you have a Eucrit value under, or excuse me, if you have a frog value under Eucrit, but your frequency of tetraploids is higher than T-crit, you will overcome MCE. So as I mentioned earlier, the fitness of cytotypes also plays a role in overcoming MCE. So let's take a look at how that actually relates, given these our newfound knowledge of these two critical values. So in the middle here, we're seeing what we just saw on the previous slide, where the tetraploid is actually equally as fit as the diploid. And when the tetraploid is less fit than the diploid, we see that T-crit and U-crit actually increase. 
And when the tetraploid is more fit than the diploid, we see that the T crit and U crit values actually decrease, which I think makes intuitive sense. And so it's actually kind of hard to look at all of these single points and understand the relationship. So here I actually plot them. Again, just reminding us that uh, this is what the figures look like on the previous slide. But here on the right, what we see is when the tetraploid is less fit than the diploid, U crit and T crit both increase dramatically. Whereas when the tetraploid is more fit than the diploid, T crit and U crit both decrease, meaning that with increased tetraploid fitness to the diploid, we, it's easier to overcome MCE. And so kind of to summarize, what we've seen so far is that in order to explain the prevalence of polyploids, we need to overcome MCE. And to do that, tetraploids have to reach a certain frequency in the population, and they either have to have a high fitness or a high frog value to overcome MCE. So now let's take a look at what I did in my work. So in my extension, I compare the outcomes from an evaluation of this model with a static frog to the outcomes with a stochastic frog. And I looked at, uh, I looked across an input of frog values from one to 20% by half percent increments. And each iteration was run for 500 generations and there were 10,000 simulations run for each parameter input set. So under a static frog simulation, I started with an entirely diploid population and selected a, a frog value, or excuse me, used this frog value set at a static value, here depicted at 2% by this red line, and then solved the model equations from the previous slides and repeated steps two and three for the 500 generations. For the stochastic frog simulations, again, I started with an entirely diploid population and then frog was actually selected from a simulated distribution shown here in this blue area that had a mean equal to the static frog value that it was going to be compared by. And I looked at four different types of four different distribution types, and ultimately log normal was the best fit to the empirical data in what was used throughout this analysis. So again, then uh, the equations were solved and steps two and three were repeated with each for all 500 generations with each generation having another random draw from this frog distribution. So for all of these simulations, I tracked if T crit was passed or not, which under a static framework is this binary of yes or no. And under the stochastic framework, it's actually the percent runs that, oh, that pass T crit. And just as a reminder, passing T crit means overcoming MCE. So that's what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of this talk but it really is the percent runs that pass a T crit value. So let's look at the results. First, here's the result under a static frog analysis. And we see this stepwise behavior where U crit is approximately 17%, meaning that frog would need to be approximately 17% to overcome MCE when starting with just diploids. So let's add the stochastic results and see how they compare. So, the blue line represents the percent runs that overcome MCE when the mean of the distribution is equal to that of the mean frog. And so first off, what we can see is it changes things quite a bit. And there's actually this opening up of parameter space for frog values where it's possible to overcome MCE where it was not under the static simulation. But how do we actually quantify this? So to quantify this, I came up with two new critical values. The first being psi 0.5 which is the mean frog value when 50% of the simulations overcome MCE. And so that is represented here and corresponds to approximately 8%. And so actually you can, we can think of this psi 0.5 value as the mean frog when the tetraploid has the same probability of overcoming MCE as it does not. And the second critical value is psi one, which is the mean frog value when 100% of the simulations overcome MCE, and that's shown here. And this is actually directly comparable to UCRIT because again, it's with 100% certainty in our simulations that we see that MCE is overcome. And here, that value is approximately 12%. And so it's not as low as the psi 0.5, but it is still quite a bit lower than um, UCRIT. And so kind of ultimately what can be seen here is that when including the very, when including stochasticity and variation in frog, we see that 
a moderate mean frog value permits overcoming MCE when before it was not under this static um, framework. And so as before, when I when we looked at those fitness relationships between cytotypes changing T crit and U crit values, let's take a look at how the psi 0.5 and the psi 1 values also change with fitness. So first, just to remind us, this is the relationship of U crit with fitness, where on the right-hand side of one is when the tetraploid is more fit than the diploid, and on the left side of one, the tetraploid is less fit than the diploid. And so before we actually add those stochastic critical values, let's take a look at how Ucrit actually compares the variation in FRUG that we observe in nature. So this black gradient corresponds to the range that exists in the empirical population means for different FRUGs or for FRUG and relates to the y-axis, where this orange line is a density distribution of the population means for this array for the range of empirically meet range of observed empirical mean frog values. And so what we see is that, again, we see that kind of 2% mean, but we see this variation is now included. And what we see is that U crit doesn't actually cross into the range of observed empirical mean frog until the tetraploid is at least twice as fit as the diploid, meaning, again, that it's a pretty strict, um, strict cutoff that the tetraploid has to be incredibly fit compared to the diploid in order to in order to overcome MCE under this kind of static frog analysis. So when we add the psi 0.5 value, what we see is that the psi 0.5 crosses into the range of observed empirical mean frog when the tetraploid is actually less fit than the diploid. It is approximately 0.75 here. And that um, we see that the, this kind of, as the fitness of the tetraploid increases relative to the diploid, it just becomes easy, it's more likely that we're going to overcome MCE. And so ultimately what we can say here is that it's just as, um, excuse me, that when we include the variation in FRUG, it's just as likely that MCE is going to be overcome as it's not for a whole suite of fitness values where it wasn't possible before. And so last but not least, let's look at the psi one value and where, see where that falls. And so just as a reminder, psi one corresponds directly to U crit kind of under this stochastic framework. And what we see is that the psi one value actually crosses into the range of observed empirical mean frogs when the tetraploid is just a little bit more fit than the diploid. So, and then likewise in, with, um, as we increase fitness, it, it still drops down. And so one thing that's kind of important to notice here is that um, the, when we look at a variable frog, we can demonstrate how MCE can be overcome in nature when it wasn't possible under a static frog analysis. And further, that kind of between, with, with our two new critical values, we see that the tetraploid doesn't have to be twice as fit as the diploid. Rather, it can actually be just as fit or maybe even a less, less fit than the diploid and still overcome MCE. Again, given this kind of static, and, or excuse me, the stochastic um, framework of looking at this formation rate of unreduced gametes. So up until now, theory has not been able to fully support this observation of polyploid prevalence that we observe. But through this work, I think I've made it or hopefully have made it a little more clear that FRUG is a key underexplored factor that helps resolve this paradox of frequent polyploid establishment. And the variation in FRUG helps to contribute to our understanding of the observed prevalence of polyploids. And so some future directions from this work are that we don't need to continue to look for this general polyploid advantage Rather, we need to understand where the variation frog is coming from, and then we can use that in our models to help predict and better understand the dynamics of what's really going on. And so some of the empirical questions to, to be actually be addressed are, are frogs species specific? Um, do we have, what are the effects of hybridization and in allopolyploid formation? And what about temporal variation where we see do we see plant and age structure, such as the flower structure, really mattering um, in terms of the rate of unreduced gametes? And given back, going back to the 
presentation about the um, interaction between genotype and climate or environment that are there autocorrelations with the environment of you know particularly hot years or cold years leading to a higher frog um, and then what kind of spatial variation exists in frog and is that looking at the population level or across populations and then once we have a greater breadth of that data we can go back to the models and start asking questions about is is this better modeled as a population level process or an individual level process? And what kind of variation and where can we work that into our models? And so with that, I would just like to acknowledge my funding sources, the lab groups I'm a part of and my dissertation committee. And I'm happy to take any questions that people may have. Thank you. All right, well, well thank you, Ben. That was a, a really wonderful talk as well. Um, as usual, folks can pop on their audio video and ask away or uh, post your question in the chat and uh, go from that, yeah, that way there. Okay, I've got a question that um, might be a Ben question, might be a Julia question, and either or both of you can chime in on it. Um, do we have any evidence that um, rate of unreduced gamete formation is heritable on the individual level? Um, well, I, there's been some genes identified that play a key role in unreduced gamete production. So I don't think we know how much variation in unreduced gamete production. Like we don't have great estimates of the heritable, like estimates of heritability. How much is result of environmental variation versus genetics? Um, we know that it is heritable, but how much of it is, I think we, we still don't know, which would be a great, which would be a great thing to know. <laughs> <laughs> so that to, to follow up, I think with Ben, um, I, this could totally be just a misunderstanding of your models here, but your generations were just, you know, iterative values of the model, not actually modeling generations of plants. Sorry. So yes, it was generations of plants, um, or sorry, I guess a clarification iterated. So like we had our frequency of the two cytotypes and that was changing, uh, tracking through generations, but it was not a genotype uh, type relation. So was that generational tracking, you know, when you had, so I guess was the heritability built in and you know, were the, the successful polyploids being selected for to increase their frequency in the next generation? Because no. if these are heritable, then that's gonna really increase the rate at which polyploids can persist and establish. Yes, absolutely. And so no, there was kind of no heritability assumed in how that model is set up to kind of, again, be kind of this very null, like when we just look at variation in this period, how does the model behave? So yeah, we need estimates of heritability to then be able to put into this model and say, oh, well, if we're tracking at genotypes and we, uh, we can see the heritability and we know the heritability, wow, it actually is very easy or not easy given different circumstances. Cool. Well, thanks both of you. All right, looks like uh, our next question from uh, Justin Conover. Hi, uh, thanks Ben for a great talk. Um, I'm wondering what other distributions you used for your um, frog and why you and why log normal was the best one. Is that actually like based on the mechanistic process or is that just the best fit? So you chose to go with that one. Yeah, so the other distributions that I looked at were a beta, gamma and Weibull distributions. And I used an R package to help look at kind of the best fit from um, Julia's data split out at the population level. So I looked at all, actually I only looked at 59 populations because one population had, I think only four individuals. So we weren't able to like fit a distribution to, to that. But yes, log normal came out um, as the majority of the time, the best fit for that, that kind of subsetting of the data. Um, and there kind of is an intuitive reason for that being that, right, like log normal distributions would arise from this multiplicative process. And being that there's like multiple ways, right, that we can have unreduced gametes form, it makes sense that it, they would be the result of a multiplicative process. Okay, 
that makes sense. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, looks like uh, Jeanette Witten has her hand up, so I'll let Jeanette pop on there. Um, hi, Ben and Julia. Um, awesome connection of talks here today. Mm -hmm. uh, my brain is firing uh, fast relative to my caffeine level, for sure. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Ben, I had a question about the how to think about the model in that um, it's, it's fundamentally a, a model of a, a population in which um, tetraploidy can invade and go to fixation. And so what I was wondering, and, and maybe this is a really broad question for everyone, is how, what would the signature of local replacement of diploids be? How, how, how common do we think that kind of outcome is as opposed to where we see tetraploids on the landscape, they've actually colonized a place not occupied by diploids um, and, uh, and essentially established their distributions via those kinds of mechanisms. And you know, my intuition, and, and I think um, is that, is not just that that is common, but that we think that's really common, but what would that, how would we detect the difference between those two? Um, and I throw that out to anybody because I don't, I don't know that I have an answer and I've puzzled over this a bit. I mean, what, what kind of signature, like what would we be looking at to detect that in the first place? Do you mean for like the frequency, like, like are we talking about unreduced gamete data or like what do you have in mind? I, anything that would help yeah. us understand the frequency of local replacement versus um, versus colonization. Yeah. You know, so because in, in a model where it's mostly colonization, then essentially tetraploids rarely do what you describe, Ben, rarely win in a local context. And you know, instead they maybe they persist in a local context, which is even easier, right? To to sort of in that period in which they persist to then colonize unoccupied spots. And so it's sort of like this meta population dynamics. And yeah, at the risk of going into comment, not question, um, you know, it, it seems like one of the things that we might expect is that polyploids wouldn't then, if they often locally replace, that they wouldn't have ranges, right? They would, they would have sort of, you know, spotty occurrences within broader ranges of, uh, of their progenitors, for example, which I don't think is often the case. Yeah, I, oh, sorry, good. No, no, go ahead. I was just gonna say it's interesting to think about, especially in the context of Ben's results about, you know, what the fitness of the poly has to be like, and maybe are we seeing more on the right side of that? More the ones that mm -hmm. persist are the ones that are much more Sorry, <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I, I've also thought about, you, you know, uh, Jeanette, I thought about this as well, trying to think about the, um, those dynamics and I, I don't know, it, it really depends on the, how, how much you assume the, uh, uh, the tetraploid production is ongoing in that population while it's replacing the diploids. I guess when I think about it, like sort of, you know, the, if you were to look at the, the genotype or the diversity, at least of the polyploid, the tetraploid population here, um, I might expect if there's local replacement that you'd have higher diversity than in a colonization scenario, just like we see with a lot of other uh, in, in colonizing or invasive uh, species dynamics. But I'm not sure that's the case. We had data from the Sky Islands for one of the Slotch Ella um, allotetraploids that we had able to get like herbarium sheets to resurrect off of and had rad seek data, right? And we could see, and the diploids aren't here as far as we know. Um, but you can see sort of these waves of genotype replacement over the last century, every every decade or so. Uh, and so, I, but it would like totally replace the previous one. <laughs> and so I kind of think that might be the what you might expect is that if it's going outside of the range of the diploids, you get this sort of, these genotypes kind of just clonal, I don't know, clonally, but just sort of replacing yeah. what's out there. And so much so much lower genetic diversity there in that scenario, that, that, that would be my initial armchair exp expectation <laughs> but i don't know it's a really good question um and how you would distinguish what those what those processes would look like um, 
wondering if you could almost do like a phylogenetic approach or something where, you know, if you find, say, scattered diploid and tetraploid populations and you start seeing like pairs of diploids and tetraploids that are, you know, sympatric or parapatric to each other as opposed to, you know, scattered diploid populations and then sort of like this broad clade of, of tetraploids. Yeah. You know, that might more support sort of the, you know, wave of tetraploids have come through and, and extirpated everything else as opposed to sort of be like a you know, popcorn kind of coexistence thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what you'd need replicated. Yeah. A lot of data to collect. <laughs> But I think it's also okay to have some of these more comment than question things here because both of the more comment than question things are also driven by real interesting questions at the end. So, <laughs> yeah, well, it's very really inspiring to see these data and um, and think about their ramifications for how things both originate and then spread, right, and become successful on a landscape. And uh, yeah, so very inspiring in that regard. Thanks a lot, Jeanette. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, there are a few questions uh, from before as well that we weren't able to, to get to. Um, and I think the first of those starts with uh, Brittany's question. Perhaps she's already um, addressed that. This is the, I've got a question regarding the yeah. low underneath gamete frequency in, uh, in so, sulfurs, so. Um, Julia, your, your graph, your, I guess, violin plot that you showed yeah. with the, you know, modes of reproduction and, you know, rate of unreduced gamete formation. Um, I realize that this falls in the three that were not significantly different from each other. So yeah, feel free. I, no, I think you're right. Different. It looked like um, sulfurs were lower, right? Than the, the mixed meters or the outcrossers. So do you think that's real? And if so, that kind of goes against what you were setting up. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I mean, it seems, I, I don't think I have a reason to doubt it. Some of the species I pulled out, um, I think out of my interest sake, uh, tend to have a, a little, like, tend to look like they they might have been different, but especially when you control for the phylogenetic relatedness, you see that's not the case. And I think, I mean, the assumption that lower effective population size leads leads to relaxed selection on this trait is a is a pretty simple one for sulfurs, and there could be a lot of other stuff going on. Like one of the things I was thinking about is the lower pollen to ovule ratio in sulfurs. And that might actually mean maybe, you know, maintaining pollen function is maybe more important. There might be more stringent selection on, on pollen in sulfurs than in outcrossers. Um, but there's a lot of like other things that might be at play there, whether that's like, you know, there's purging of recessive mutations in sulfurs and whether, you know, if there, what what are the dominance of these mutations that underlie unreduced gamete production? And so I think there's a lot of, things that could play into some of the, the fact that that hypothesis didn't seem to play out perfectly for sulfurs. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure why. It would be cool to find out. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah, and one there from uh, Thomas uh, um, about uh, genetic versus environmental. I think we've kind of touched on some of these in some of the other comments already, but go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, what what do we know about the relative importance of like environment versus genetics? Well, actually, um, Wayne Parrott followed up. There are some estimates of unreduced gamete heritability uh, in alfalfa. So uh, this was a cultivar, I think 46 to 70 percent, 40 to 60 percent in these cultivars. So again, these these were I think these were breeding cultivars. I think maybe that's why it skipped skipped my kind of literature review because we were looking at for specifically like natural populations. Um, but obviously that implies a really important genetic component, but I think we were seeing so much variation among individuals, even with, if, within the same population among, you know, um, uh, different environmental collections that our results, the variation we were seeing, I think spoke to the importance of um, environment, maybe just as much as the, the heritability. And I think that fits with some of those estimates that we just looked at. Um, All right, and uh, let's see what's next there. Who's next there? Um, uh, Joseph uh, uh, Williams there with the question about uh, uh, 
uh, rest in the of the G1 uh, sperm do not rest in the G1 cell cycle in a Arabidopsis. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, did I see variation in the 2C fluorescence values that might suggest sperm were continuing to progress through the sperm cycle? Yeah, it's been a while since I since I've looked at those fluorescent plots a few years now, but I do remember some were much cleaner than others, and um, whether that is a result of this kind of continuing through the cell cycle, um, you might be you should be able to tease that apart with the flow cyt cytometric gating. Um, a lot of the time that the, that kind of smear we might see at the 2C peak might also result from debris or doublets, uh, so, so nuclei sticking together. Um, but with many of the different metrics you get from it, I think that's something that you'd be able to tease apart. But I, um, I, I don't remember making any insightful observations with respect to that, but I think that would be cool to look at. Yeah, I was just thinking uh, and a couple of things. To Vegetative cells should be staying in G1, so that's a reliable 1C, but you might see a smear going to the right of your 2C yeah. if, if nuclei were starting to move through the cell cycle. Um, but you, you might also, you know, if you, if you looked at pollen sizes, that might tell you that you're really looking at unreduced pollen and not... Oh, I see. Yeah, so how much... How much, to a four yeah. C how much is it biasing? Yeah, so we, we did do some of the confirmation um, that we didn't, I don't think we ended up putting it in the paper, but like we, we, we did some DAPI staining of some of our, of some of our um, uh, solutions that we passed through the flow cytometer to um, double check that, you know, for, you know, a particular, an individual particularly high rates of unreduced gamete production, we were seeing, you know, uh, pollen or grains that were approximately double the size. Um, at a higher proportion in that um, in that staining, so we did that for a select number of individuals just to make sure what we were seeing. But you know, yeah. for seventeen hundred individuals, it's like the throughput of the the staining isn't you know isn't quite there. <laughs> so, all right. There's a, one last question um, from uh, Pierre. Uh, and I actually had this question as well. So uh, this is whether or not you had the opportunity to test a single individual at different sampling times or different inflorescences at the same sampling time, you know, to simply get a yeah. sense of how stable that uh, unreduced gamete production is in yeah. these individuals. Yeah, it's something that I, I didn't look at in a, any systematic way, um, which would have been really nice to do just to have, you know, even like for a select number, maybe like 20 individuals, like, how, well, how much did the sampling time itself influence some of the values that we were looking at? And something I didn't have the opportunity to do, but I think I would have done um, looking back. And even like, I've um, been just talking about the, the technique we took, like, so I would collect these in the field and a lot of the time I'd collect large amounts of plants, like bringing back 200 plants that I couldn't possibly process in the same day. So we would actually desiccate the, so I'd extract the anthers I'd suspend, uh, and I'd desiccate the answers. And so, um, um, I, 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 the, the pollen grain was in good condition when you would rehydrate it, like, um, and it worked well for flow cytometry, but also, yeah, so I think there's some technical things that would be curious to see how much that actually impact the values that we're looking at. But I think the age of the plant, like, that's another thing. I mean, I collected this over the course of these samples, actually over the course of two years and through two se like through full two seasons, right? From like May to September. So um, yeah, I think there's a lot of variation in the environment, in the age of these plants, right? Um, that are probably contributing a ton to the variation that we described. All right, any uh, final questions for uh, either uh, Julia or Ben today? All right, well, with that, I'm going to close it down. And I uh, thank both of you for two really outstanding and wonderful talks, very thought provoking uh, as well, you know, shining a light on this sort of really uh, uh, sort of, uh, less uh, research than it should be area here. Um, and uh, I just want to highlight uh, that we'll be back in two weeks for the next polyclade webinar. Uh, our next two speakers on April 12th will be Joe Williams talking about polyploidy and pollen performance. And Arthur Zwanepoel uh, talking about the statistical inference of whole genome duplications in a phylogenetic context. Uh, so be sure to tune in uh, and, and join us uh, again in two weeks. Uh, I think everyone will have 
the whole planet will, will have moved to daylight savings time or at least the northern hemisphere so europe will be back with us on the same time as usual um uh but uh, otherwise keep an eye out on 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 that time zone uh so you can all join us uh, at the right time uh that'll be 11 a.m pacific all right uh with that uh a final thank you to, to ben and julia uh and everyone else for tuning in today and thanks so much mike thanks for having us you're welcome thank you you guys do all the work <laughs>